Okay. Good uh, morning, everybody, or whatever time it is where you are. Um, Selamat pagi. That's a uh, good morning from uh, Indonesia. Or uh, could be Selamat malam. Some, I think some people, it's, it's night time there. Um, so we're in part three this week. Uh, well, Asia and Biography, and we're going to talk about this man a little bit, Alfred Russell Wallace. We've talked about him already this week, so I hope you people have, have read uh, about that. Um, but briefly, um, we'll just introduce ourselves again. I'm uh, Dr. Steve Reynolds. Uh, hopefully you know that by now. Um, I've uh, actually been to Indonesia once or twice, so that's good, and I've got my uh, Bali shirt on today, so I thought that was appropriate. So I'm on this side of the line, so um, we've got the tiger here, which is on this side of the line, and we've got Pete, who's on the other side of the line. Yep, I'm Keith Christian, and I haven't been to Indonesia, but uh, I do have a long-standing interest in biogeography and in, in Wallace, so um, hopefully I can bring that to the, to the table. Yeah. So today we're really, um, as we mentioned, we're talking about uh, biogeography, and um, we'll talk a bit about the Wallace line and, and those sorts of ideas. So, uh, as usual, uh, in the webinar, we will um, talk about some points of interest that we, we've covered in part three and try to elaborate on those. Uh, there's been some comments in the, in the forum, so we'll talk a little bit about some of those comments that we've had. And uh, again, during the, uh, the webinar, so you can, you can respond to questions, so there's polling, and also live chat. So most people, I think, have already uh, found the chat box, so that's good. Um, so at any time, uh, send in your questions, say hello, uh, make comments. Uh, so just type in the chat box and, and press enter and, and everyone can see what's going on there. So don't forget to use the chat. And we will have several uh, questions, activities. So these are uh, multiple choice really in this one. I think they're mostly ABC. So there's a little box there. There's a hands up and to the right of that is the polling box. So you can poll and um, make your choice, and then we'll put those answers up to see what uh, people think about the various questions that we, that we pose. So what have we done this week? So we've looked at um, Alfred Russell Wallace, and yeah, he's a bit of a hero of mine, and I think Keith is, is um, a bit of an advocate of, of Wallace as well. Uh, so he went to the Amazon, and then he spent eight years uh, in the Malay archipelago, so really a long time out there in the field, collecting and, and you know traveling around. So a bit like Darwin, he, he traveled a lot as well. Um, so the Wallace Line, which now bears his name, so between uh, Bali and Lombok, and also uh, west of, of Sulawesi. And uh, we've also had a little bit of thinking about Darwin and Wallace, um, the timeline there to see when when different things happened in their lives. Um, and you know, sort of came together, where they published their papers in the Linnaean Society with a mechanism of natural selection, and uh, and then actually Wallace lived right through into um, the early 20th century. And so yep, that's right. It's probably worth mentioning. We uh, haven't made too big a deal of it in the web in the um, in the MOOC, but mm. those people in Darwin will know that um, the museum here here in Darwin has a uh, uh, just this month opened an exhibition all about Wallace and Wallace's line in this time. And the reason for that opening now is that this month, earlier this month, December 7th, was the 100th anniversary of the death of Wallace. And so, um, uh, so it's, it's, at least in Darwin, there's been quite a bit of uh, yeah. uh, publicity about that. It's a big exhibition. If anybody, uh, there's a chance it'll be on until uh, I think till next June, so you know it's, it's around for a while. But anybody has come through Darwin, they definitely yeah. uh, recommend that. Pretty interesting exhibition. Yeah. Lots of really good stuff they they managed to get a hold of. Um, and really for us in Darwin, because we're in northern Australia, uh, it's it's you know we're actually pretty really close to this region, just north of us. So not very far away is Timor. And you know, to the west of that is Nusa Tenggara and Bali and Lombok. So, and lots of people actually travel to Indonesia. They go to Bali for their holidays and things like that. So, for us, it's actually we we feel in a way that we're sort of we're almost in Asia, really. And it's certainly as far as Australia goes, we're we're right up there, Darwin. You know, we're we're very close to this region. So, for us, it's 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 extra interesting because it's very close and there's some resemblance 
uh, with the animals and plants between between here and there. And so hopefully now, I'm sure as you're aware of this Wallace line, so between Sulawesi and Borneo, and then between Bali and Lombok, so in this Lombok Strait here. And this is the area in particular where Wallace was very surprised because it wasn't a very wide, you know, just a, a small body of water, 20 miles wide, how many kilometers that is. Um, so he's very surprised to see the differences either side of that line. Yeah, that's really amazing, especially since some of those differences are birds, and you think of birds make, yeah. making a you know, 20 mile uh, cross over water pretty easily, but yeah. most of them don't, in fact. Yeah, so it's actually surprising that things didn't, don't cross the line in a way. And I guess that's partly why he was surprised, because it was a division between these realms, and yet it was you know, just this short little water gap. So I guess we'll start thinking about the... Um, we've got a couple of examples here. And we just want people to just to respond and, and think what, which side of these lines are these animals from. So the oriental side, so the other side, so that, that's, that's my side. Um, the Australian Australasian side, so Australia and New Guinea, that side. Or maybe a bit of both. Maybe they actually spread around through that region and, and they're actually kind of either side. So if we think about the distribution, the first one we thought was, was salamanders because so they're amphibians. I know there's, there's, there's frogs. Um, there's one group, there's salamanders, which is the, the amphibians with, with tails. They tend to live in wet places. The other group actually we were thinking about was the Sicilians, which are these weird worm-like um, amphibians, and they live in tropical areas uh, throughout the world. So there's ones in Southeast Asia, there's ones in Africa, and there's ones also in, in South America, so in places like the Amazon. But with regard to the salamanders, I guess the question then is, is you know, do, do salamanders occur in Australia, for example? Um, so, yeah, are they... Let's see what, the let's see, let's see what people think about that. So we've got a few people responding. What do we think? Just give them a couple more seconds. Okay, so what have we got there? Yeah, oriental. So most people are saying oriental. Yep. A couple Australasian. And a few both. So a few sort of going in between there, fudging to seeing sort of seeing what they're ways. going both ways. So actually it's a funny thing, but I, I mean, I lived in Australia all my life. The first salamander I ever saw was in North America. So for someone like myself coming from Australia, um, it's, salamanders are kind of unusual things for us. So whereas Keith, I guess you would have, you know, seen. Yeah, I grew up in North America, so I'm more familiar with salamanders. But yeah, that's, that's right. They're not. They haven't made it to Australia yet. There are a lot of other amphibians. There are a lot of frogs. Only frogs. Yeah. The only the only amphibian group. But there's quite a diversity, and some of these are endemic. In fact, there's, uh, even at the, the level of family, there's some just Australian families of frogs, yeah. and um, most all of the species, except for just a few, are, are completely endemic to That's right. Australia. So. A couple we share with New Guinea, but basically, and so a whole family. So I've, I've put some examples here. This is a, uh, a, a highland frog or a tree frog. This is a Latoria bicolor. And this is another one. So these are ones that occur near Darwin. And so this family, or some people consider it a subfamily, um, only really occurs in Australia. It's related to a family in South America. But yeah, like the myobatracid frogs, the ground frogs, there's a family, a whole family that only occurs in Australia. So whereas the salamanders um, in South America, a little bit, but mostly lots in, lots in North America. And Europe. And, and Europe, and lots in Europe. So really a northern... Uh, hemisphere kind of a group really that's sort of spread down into but hasn't really crossed um, Wallace's line at all so no salamanders on our side. Uh, so the next one we wondered about was the woodpeckers and now um, again which side of the line people think these from most people are familiar with woodpeckers they climb up and down trees they make little holes and get grubs out and um, and you know fairly fairly diverse and they occur in most parts of the world. Um, so they, are they, they're not that common though, are they? I suppose in some places they are. Some places they are, yeah. yeah. They're pretty common in North America. Right, yeah. So probably, maybe most people would have seen a woodpecker at some stage. Um, so 
What did people say about that? Someone said, long ago I saw a salamander in Tronga Park Zoo. Well, that's right. If you're in Australia, about the only place you'd see a salamander is in a zoo. So, again, hope we've got pretty, got pretty much everyone's, yeah, everyone's onto this one, which is good because that's one of the ones I think we mentioned in the, in the MOOC. Um, so, that's right, Oriental, and I was going to put this little thing here from India, but I thought that would, would have given it away. This photo is actually from an example. But, yeah, so they occur pretty much everywhere else uh, except Australasia. So there's none in New Guinea, there's none in Australia. But it's interesting that um, what we do have is our own endemic species, things like tree creepers and satellas, and also there's a group called the babblers, and they do similar sorts of things. They don't necessarily make holes. We don't have any, Australia hasn't involved in anything that really digs holes in trunks, but they look under bark and they walk up and down trees and they do all those sorts of things that woodpeckers do. So we have sort of equivalents, I suppose, but they're not, they're not, they're not woodpeckers. We don't actually have any woodpeckers. So um, Wallace actually commented on this, and this is a, a quote uh, from the Malay Archipelago, and he's talking here about how Australia is really quite different. And so because Australia was isolated for so long, as it travelled north and then gradually got up towards Asia, uh, it evolved lots of um, different species and it's got lots of unusual endemic species, so species that only occur in Australia. And Wallace here comments on the fact that we don't have apes or monkeys or wolves or bears or any of those things that are common in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but I thought it was interesting here that actually now we have some of those things because we have sheep, we have horses running wild, and we certainly have rabbits. And of course, these are placental mammals from the Northern Hemisphere mostly, but they've been introduced by humans. So that's you know really changed the ecology uh, of Australia. So it was just mostly marsupials and a few other placental mammals. Um, Wallace also says that it has marsupials only. Now, hopefully if people have been reading the MOOC, they would realise that that's not entirely correct. Um, yep, so the, the, certainly the marsupials are probably the most conspicuous mammals, yeah. there's no doubt about that, but uh, you don't have to look too hard to start finding native rodents, uh, so rats and mice of different yeah. sorts, yeah. and we also have <coughs> introduced rats and mice, but there are uh, endemic rats and mice that are rodents that have evolved here, mm. um, even water rats and things like that. So quite a diversity. Of and then there are also bats, and quite a few bats. So those are two mammalian groups that are not marsupials. Mm. And then of course there's the monotremes, but that's a pretty strong, only a couple of species that have yeah. the platypus and, um, the and, and the echidna. Yeah. Um, so uh, roughly, I think we looked yesterday, it was about half, about 50% of the species are um, marsupials and yep. about 50% are these uh, rodents and, and bats. And bats. Yes, yeah, so it's actually quite a diversity. So yeah, about 50-50, so Wallace wasn't quite correct. There's something like 60 species of native rodents. So lots of um, and whole, you know, native genera that have evolved. Uh, the Pseudomys group is a whole group of native rodent species. Uh, that have evolved in Australia to live in deserts and all sorts of places. So throughout Australia you have rodents, you see wherever you go there's at least one or two or three different species of rodents, so, and, and bats nearly everywhere as well. Yeah, apart from the, the flying foxes, which are uh, the big fruit bats, are very conspicuous, but most of these other rodents, are, you really have to sort of be looking for them to yeah. go out to, to see them. So there aren't the conspicuous big mammals, yeah. except for the marsupials or kangaroos and things like that. So someone's asking there about why the bats would have made the jump across the Wallace line. Well, it's interesting. So some birds have. So we talked about woodpeckers and maybe they didn't move very much. Um, we've spoken about some things that do. So, for example, birds of prey, coastal birds, all those sorts of things. They move around a lot. But the smaller passerine birds, the perching birds, quite often didn't cross. Whereas bats the sort of thing they fly, they go in at night, and also things get, get blown, like we get big yeah. storms and stuff. Yeah, it's probably almost certainly the case that, that, that big storms contribute to it. And, I mean, we occasionally, from time to time, uh, a, an, an Asian bird gets blown here, yep. and it's sort of a big event, all the bird watchers come and, and, and watch it and, and kick it off with this and so forth. Yeah. But, uh, it's probably a pretty rare event, and one bit of evidence that suggests that uh, bats were blown here at some time, but 
it probably doesn't happen on, on a regular basis is the fact that there's no rabies in Australia, and rabies, you know, bats are uh, fairly uh, common carriers of rabies, even in, in, in Southeast Asia. So it's not that far away, but it's never gotten here, and which, you know, it's a very good thing. Good thing for us, because they do, they do get it in Indonesia, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so some things have been, and, you know, possibly some would have come down via New Guinea and through into Australia, and possibly so there's a lot of bats, same, similar sorts of genera in Australia and New Guinea. And certainly the things like the fruit bats, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question how some groups really have managed to get across, uh, and some groups haven't. So obviously with things like frogs, they can't get across the saltwater barrier, so they didn't get here at all. But certain sorts of birds have. Uh, so the next group, um, well, we, it does mention a bit about how birds about in terms of the Australian birds. I like this one here that Wallace calls them honey suckers. We call them honey eaters now. I think that's what he's referring to. But also things like the cockatoos, so we have lots of parrots and things that um, they don't tend to get. And we've also talked about the uh, the mound makers, the, the megapodes. So we've spoken a bit about that in the MOOC. So the next one then is again we're still thinking about Wallace line. Now I think this one should be pretty straightforward. So this is an, an agile wallaby. Um, so they are. Um, what can we say about them which doesn't really give it away too much? They're a, a grazing mammal. <laughs> they, they like to hop around. Um, they, they're, they're herbivores. Uh, let's see. They, um, they're unusual in that they hop. So we think of most mammals, you know, deer and, and sheep and all sorts of things as running around on their four limbs. Um, this is from the family uh, Macropodidae. And so you see its name there, Macropus agilis. And so that means Bigfoot, which is, I think, fairly appropriate. They have very big feet that they hop around on. So hopefully this one, let's see what we've got here. Yep. Yep. So oh, it's pretty much, well, a few people have said no, but um, of all the people that we, really, yeah, so pretty high percentage of, of uh, Australasian there. So that's good. So we're thinking about, um, so the, the agile wallaby is interesting in that actually, so it's something that we it occurs here. So we, we do see them as, as reasonably common around Darwin um, in suitable habitat. But it also occurs in southern New Guinea. And so this southern part of New Guinea is actually some of it's savannah. And the country there is actually very similar, uh, has eucalypts and things like that. It's very similar to the sort of country we see in northern Australia. So um, there's quite a few species, well, not quite, there's a few species that are in common. Um, across, just a few frogs like we mentioned, uh, and so but this so the the agile wallabies obviously it's, it's it's a member of this whole macropod group. So we think of the kangaroos, the wallabies, things like the paddy melons. So there's all kinds of weird examples of those, particularly in Australia. So big radiation of these um, macropods in in Australia. The next example is a thing called a cuscus. Now, some people, depending on where they are or have been, might be aware of, of what a cuscus is. Obviously, it's a mammal. It's very furry. This one's particularly cute, I think. Uh, so this one's, uh, they're arboreal mammals, so they like to climb up in trees. This one has a, a prehensile tail, so it can use that as a bit of a thing to help it uh, climbing. Not sure that they can hang off it as such, but um, they certainly do use it in climbing. So, uh, do people, what do they think about this one? Is this likely to be more Oriental or Australasian or maybe a bit of both? So a few people have voted. What have we got here? Oh, looks like looks like we've got a bit of a mix. Okay. So yeah, pretty spread there. So some people have gone for both. Um, well, what we can say is that actually this. Um, this cuscus is a marsupial, so that's that's the first real clue. But this is actually the Sulawesi bear cuscus. Um, so what this is is this is a species that's endemic to Sulawesi, and if people uh, recall, Sulawesi is sort of over there in the middle. So you've got Sulawesi, and then Wallace's line went this side, really between Sulawesi and Borneo. So it's on the Australian side. So it really, is, it's on yeah. the Australian side, but it's sort of only just in. Yeah. You know, I feel yeah. like it's it's sort of. And Wallace actually had a bit of a trouble with Sulawesi because it did have a bit of a mix. 
It had a couple of marsupials, so there's actually two species of endemic uh, cuscus on Sulawesi, so two species of marsupial, and a, a range of other mammals, including lots of endemic species. So it's kind of its little own world. It's a bit of a, a bit unusual. So it is in the Australian region, so it's only just in. So, you know, people who said Oriental were probably only sort of just out. It's almost like it could have got across. Um, and what it is, it's, it's an old lineage. And it looks like, you know, some people think that these are maybe sort of um, diverged off from other cuscuses something like 15 or 20 million years ago. That's the estimates on things like Mokio clocks. And so if we think about the geological configuration, this is at 30 million years ago, and here you can see the top part of Australia, and then there's proto New Guinea, so this is the southern part of New Guinea, and some or most of this area here would have been land. So this is the northern part of the Australian plate, pushing up into Asia. Over here we can see Borneo, there's Java, so the, the bigger islands, and this is the, the western part of Sulawesi. And then what happened was, as we go on, so going to skipping forward 10 million years, which is quite a long period of time really, but um, here's the actual parts of Sulawesi joining up. So the eastern part seems like it was part of the Australian plate, and the western part seems like it was part of the Eurasian plate, based on the geological evidence, which is pretty clear now, and it actually came together and joined. And probably what happened is things like the Sulawesi bear cuscus arrived on Sulawesi around about this time, and then later some of this area here was separated by ocean, so these just became little islands, and so it got isolated there for quite a long period of time, and so that's why it seems like it might have been diverged uh, from, the, from, that, from that whole group. Someone's there, um, someone's very surprised to see a wallaby in Papua, that's interesting. So there's actually a lot of, quite a few marsupial species in Papua New Guinea, yeah. a good diversity of them there, and some of them evolve into groups that we actually don't really get in Australia. I think we have a slide of that later with some numbers. Some numbers, numbers about numbers that. different types um, of uh, marsupials. And someone's also asked areas. about, is it related to a koala? Uh, well, they're very distantly. Yeah, distantly. They are in the same group, so they're um, diprotodont um, marsupials, so in the general group, but they're completely different families. So they are arboreal mammals, but they're different families that have, that have evolved into with arboreal forms. And there's only one species of koala, of course, but there's quite a few um, ranges of cuscuses. The cuscuses are closely related to the possums, basically, so it's kind of a, it's like a version, a version of the possum, basically. There was a question there, was the yellow area in that graph yep. land as well? Yes, that's the, that's the Asian part of the... Yeah, so generally speaking, so if at low sea level, so, you know, when we say perhaps 100 metres below current sea level, all of this, that whole landmass there would have all been joined into one area. And similarly, this whole area here. So, yeah, that's right. That's indicating land, but at a low sea stand. So it's depending a little bit on sea levels as yeah, well. So it's a big chunk of Southeast Asia. It's a big chunk, yeah. So it's that, it's that whole bottom part of Southeast Asia. So that's the bear cuscus. And if we think in general about marsupials, they actually have this very interesting distribution, what we call a a disjunct distribution, whereby they occur in Australia and New Guinea and a few of these islands here, but they also occur over here in South America. So, and we were looking at the, um, so we have a couple of hundred species of marsupial in Australia. Um, South America actually has, has a fair diversity of marsupials as well. What are we thinking about? About a hundred species? About, about a hundred species uh, of marsupials. So, they're related. Uh, they're definitely marsupials, um, and there's one species that gets up into North America, uh, an, op an opossum. It's managed to push its way up uh, into into North America, but they're basically a southern group. So what we're seeing here is that there's a, a, a Gondwanan link, and so these are one of the things that was hard for early biogeographers like Wallace to explain, because why would you get marsupials in South America and then right around the other side of the globe? And I mean, it's a long flight from South America to Australia. Um, long, long way away, how do they happen to be in, in completely different parts of the globe? And that's why this whole idea of plate tectonics and this idea that, that, that these continents are moving around the place uh, really helped explain so many of these puzzles in biogeography. So the two aspects that, first of all, the continents are moving and it's over a very, very long period of time. Yeah. Okay. 
those both of those in, in, the, you know, in the late 1800s were very difficult concepts and very well, um, sure well not they were just sort of unthinkable like, really at the time. No one would have accepted that the continents could move, that, that yeah. whole countries and you know, things could just move around. They think that was completely <laughs> unacceptable. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Um, so if we look here, here's just some examples. So as I mentioned, there's the possums. So they're related to the cuscuses. I mentioned this is a brush-tailed possum. And this is actually one from down south. But we get them here in, in Darwin. Uh, they occur around most of Australia. And if we compare that to, this is an opossum. And this is actually one from South America. And so there's a whole group of these. And so it's a completely different family, the, the Delphidae in South America. And really, um, now it's recognised that the South American marsupial was a completely different group, completely separated from the Australian group, which really, so that's based now more on genetic evidence. But again, it, it corresponds very well with what we know about how those continents have moved apart and they've been separated for, you know, 40, 50 million years, a really long time. So, so they have a common ancestor with a very, very long time ago. A very long time ago. So this whole group um, in South America has evolved and into, you know, we mentioned a whole, whole bunch of species. But they do have in common this idea. This is a, a actually um, a kangaroo. This is a western grey kangaroo, uh, Macropus fuliginosus, which is from Western Australia. But like all marsupials, it has the pouch and there's the joey poking its head out of the pouch. And so the uh, the early stages of development are all in the pouch. Eventually, the, uh, the the young reaches a size where it can get out of the pouch and hop around. So this one. But even then, when they get big. They still hop back into the pouch whenever there's, you know, a bit of danger or something. So the females, um, so they all have this marsupium or pouch, so they, and including all the ones in, in South America. So they're morphologically they're very closely related. Yeah. So yeah, someone makes the comment they've seen a small cuscus in the wild in Timor. So yep, that's the, the spotted cuscus, isn't it? Yeah, I would think that's the, well, possibly the northern cuscus, one of the ones from New Guinea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did someone mention the cuscus there? Uh, yeah, just the bits on uh, Timor. So there's another question here about what are the species that have been introduced. And I, I think that's something we wanted to comment on because this next slide we were going to mention about this, the distribution of marsupials. And one is someone's mentioned about this, there's one species in Timor. This is actually the number of marsupial genera in Malaysia. And not, not species. Not species. So, um, and this idea is true in New Zealand. And this is, you know, confuses things a little bit because people keep introducing new species. And so, for example, New Zealand has possums, but that's because they were brought from Australia. There were never any possums, and people in New Zealand wish that there still were never any possums. <laughs> um, for them, they're a pest. Like we have rabbits and pigs and and uh, camels and things. Same thing in New Zealand. They have possums, and they don't like them. They're introduced species, and they they create all sorts of trouble. So, so this is really the range of marsupials in the Australasian region. As you can see, obviously, in Australia, we have 52 genera, so big diversity of, of genera. Yeah, that's, what, 360, 370 yeah, species. Something, lots of species. So, whereas in New Guinea, they have 21 genera, most of which are shared with Australia, but several of their own genera. And what's interesting is this little island here, Aru, which, incidentally, Wallace visited and spent a bit of time there, partly because he was looking for um, birds of paradise. But he needed to go to that eastern end of the Malay archipelago. But it's interesting because this island actually has uh, bandicoots, it has uh, a couple of species of cuscus, it has uh, a wallaby, actually a, a paddy melon, they call it, it's a kind of wallaby, it's a macropod, and also some um, desi urids, which are carnivorous marsupials. So, and these species are very clearly related or basically the same species of ones that occur in New Guinea. Uh, some of these other islands, so in the Moluccas, you have several genera on some of these islands here. Sulawesi, as we've already seen, has the bear cuscus. So there's two species of bear cuscus, both in that same genus, Ailurops. And then this one is the most northern. So it's almost up in the Philippines, uh, again, related to the bear cuscus. And so that's as far as the marsupials have reached. So if we think about this, the Wallace's line is over here. So the marsupials really didn't even get close. In fact, they made it to Sulawesi. But even the one in Timor is probably introduced. So as far as this whole area of Nusa Tenggara goes, uh, the marsupials didn't really make it there at all. So there's this one group that didn't really even get, get close to the Wallace's line, I suppose, except in Sulawesi, you'd have to argue. 
But this, oh, I wanted to show, okay, well, that's fine anyway, let's move on. So, again, we're sort of thinking about the line, but now we want to move to some plants. We've, we're kind of fauna people, but we thought we should include some plants. So, this is a forest um, of tall trees. I don't want to say where because that might give it away. It's actually a carry forest. Um, so these trees uh, grow up into, it's a hardwood, and some of these grow up into the tallest trees in the world, up to 60 metres, uh, and possibly tall, we don't know, because a lot of them were logged in the early days. Um, so there probably were some real giants. And as you can see, they form this tall forest with a, with a, with a uh, understory. The understory itself is like 10 or 12 metres uh, tall in spaces in relatively high rainfall areas. Um, so some people have voted. Let's, I'll just go to the next slide. And so it is actually, uh, oh, what have people said? I think the name gave it away. To a lot of, yeah. No, I, I've only just, so as we can see, it is actually a eucalyptus. So it's probably a lot of people are already familiar with, um, okay. with the carry. Yeah. People have actually probably have heard of carry or visited or, so this is in, occurs in southwestern Australia. Uh, it's endemic to that area. There's still a fair bit of carry forest left, which is really nice. If you ever get a chance, I would certainly recommend it. Um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful forest. All right, so that's good. So the whole eucalypts, um, so they're members of the Myrtaceae. That whole family is very well represented. So there's several hundred species of eucalyptus in Australia. It's very characteristic of Australia. You know, any Australian environment you go to pretty much has some form of eucalyptus. Um, and often, you know, around Darwin, you can go to a habitat five, six, seven, eight species of eucalyptus in one, in one area. So, very common. Um, I thought this was interesting. So, this is actually Timor. So, as we've seen, northwest of us. And there's a bunch of eucalypts growing on a, a slope, on a, on a dry slope. And this is Eucalyptus alba, which is either the same species as the one we have here. So, we have a Eucalyptus alba, or something very closely related. So again, interesting to think how these species got to Timor, um, whether we were actually joined at some point or it managed to cross a, at a low sea level, a relatively short sea barrier. Um, and Timor actually has several species of eucalyptus. Yeah. And someone in the, makes a comment that they've seen uh, eucalypts in different places and around the world remote islands and that's, they've been introduced to a lot of places, California, the west coast of the United States. I've seen them in China. In China, yeah, yeah. and um, Southeast Asia. So there, there can be a, a fast growing tree that can be used for, you know, for fuel wood and that firewood and that sort of thing. And so these are fairly recent introductions and, mm. and I, again it's another thing that people now are regretting. <laughs> At the time it seemed like a good idea but mm. uh, they've really taken over in some areas and so now some of the Australian eucalypts are, are pests as, as pest species or weeds uh, in other places, parts of the world. That's right and I mean we have our, we have plenty of weeds in Australia, lots of introduced grasses and all kinds of um, things that have been introduced but some of our the other one is the paper barks in places like the Everglades, which are getting away and, and becoming a real problem. So that's right, people transporting things around, animals and plants, has really um, obscured a lot of these relationships. Whereas when Wallace went to the Malay Archipelago, for example, you know, it was all in the state that it had been in for millions and millions of years, so he could really see it. Other than a few people would have moved some things around on boats yeah, and so on. Sort of food, food related kind of yeah. plants and, and pigs and things that's like right. that. That's right, so pigs in New Guinea, yeah. yeah. Um, and things like the cuscus, for example, where people um, actually keep them as pets and then they you know, just take one on their boat and, and move it around. Mm -hmm. So there's a few things like that. So one other plant example, and um, I thought this was an interesting one because this is a, um, a niper palm and this is a species that grows around estuaries, uh, along big rivers. Um, as you can see there, it goes right next to the water. Without giving too much away, this one actually confused people, this photo is actually of a whole group of niper palm in New Guinea. Now, that, you know, might help people, it might not, but the question about whether it's Oriental or Australasian or both, um, interesting if maybe think about the how these sorts of 
um, ants manage to disperse, so how they actually get around. Um, and I think this example might have been included, so people would have already looked at this in the MOOC. So I'm just wondering how, how people go with this one. What did people vote? Let's see what we've got. Spread. So a few people lost for Asian. Okay, what do you got? Close to forty percent said both. Right. Okay, well, I think <coughs> again people are probably doing pretty well because here's an example, and here we can see the fruit of the knife of palm. And as you can see, the bottom of the tree is actually half submerged, depending a bit on the tide. And so these are big balls like this, and they float around. And so Actually, this is a species that is widespread right through Southeast Asia. We actually get it here in northern Australia on Melville Island, so not at Darwin, but north of here. It occurs in New Guinea, it occurs right through Nusa Tenggara, and it occurs right up through to Malaysia. So it's a species that, because of the way it disperses, has actually managed to spread to lots of different places. When you say north of here, not very far north, maybe no. what, 40 kilometres? Yeah, so just across, just across the way, not far. And I've actually got a couple of other examples here. This is um, uh, a capsule from a, this is called a beach almond. It's a, it's a species of terminalia. And this is a similar thing. It grows along coastlines. And uh, part of it's actually edible. I haven't tried it. Um, but this is very, very light fruit. And these things float around as well. So again, it just floats around, gets washed up on, on a high tide on a beach. And if it's lucky, it germinates. And these are another very wide species. Another, another one that we've spoken about in the MOOC is the, um, the mangroves. And a lot of the mangroves are widespread uh, in Southeast Asia. And this is actually the propagule from a, um, a stilt-rooted mangrove that we get here. And this is one I just found washed up on the beach yesterday. And what this is, actually, is this, this hangs off the tree. And it's actually the seedling. So the, the fruit is on the tree, and this thing germinates while it's still on the tree. And then it falls off. So this is, you imagine, you know, a seedling pops out of the ground usually and then from the seed. This is already the seedling growing. This is the growing tip here. These things float around, and if they're lucky, when the tide drops, they end up poking themselves into the mud, and then they just sit there and they just grow where they are. So they just float around, and wherever they end up, um, they start growing. And so that's how they actually disperse their propagules, these mangroves. So that's partly why they're so widespread. So they just spread all around the coast, and sometimes they spread right across uh, to other countries and to other areas. So there's quite a few of these species that have this, this way of dispersing. So I guess generally then we wanted to think about this Wallace line and, and say, well, which groups have managed to cross and which haven't? Because this is what we're coming across is that some groups are getting across, and people have said about certain birds that haven't made it. Um, some things have, some things haven't. So uh, shorebirds are this example where they're migratory species and they can move around a fair bit. They, they fly quite long distances. Mangroves, I guess, well, we've seen how some of those can actually um, to get around. And bats, um, bats we've mentioned as well. So um, what have we got? We've got some replies here. We've got quite a few people going for D by the looks. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, the Z is obviously the, the right answer, but they're all they're all different in, in different ways. So the shorebirds regularly cross, you know, a couple of times a year. Yeah. So they they're crossing the line all the time. The bats have crossed, but probably that's a rare rare event, yeah. uh, and probably does well, almost certainly doesn't occur on, uh, with any regularity at all. They got here from uh, from Asia sometime long ago, and yeah, they don't fly back and forth. Really new about, no. The mangroves, again, they as we said they float around, they're good dispersers, but once they got here, there's been quite a bit of speciation. So we have a lot of species in, in, in the Darwin area, in the northern Australia, there's mm -hmm. 30 odd, or maybe even yeah, yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. A lot, quite a few species. Yeah. So there's been speciation here uh, after, the, after the mangroves. So not all the species that we have here are shared. In fact, most of them aren't shared. But certainly, the, you know, that's uh, almost certainly uh, yeah. there has been some crossing. 
So I guess it's interesting because really it just depends on what what group um, what group you're referring to about you know whether they cross the line, whether in fact you know for some plants the line like the line is not really there. For certain animals, um, things like frogs, it's like it's, it's an absolute boundary line. So it's partly a um, you know humans like to sort of categorise things and and make generalizations and this is it's a generalization it's a it's a boundary line that we can draw which demarcates the area where generally speaking the species are characteristic of that area there's a lot of endemic species like for example in Australia um, and it does differ from another area but really it's a it's you know it's just a boundary line it, in a, in some ways it's arbitrary and it really depends on which group which group we're talking about one of the yeah. we spoke about was the goannas for yeah or re reptiles in general are, are pretty good dispersers in the sense, sorry, unlike amphibians, they, they can go a long time without water um, and so they can sit on the raft for days, even weeks, and, and, and still survive. So geckos are probably the yeah. best colonizers and they're yeah. sort of notorious for crawling into trees or into boats and all, all sorts of things. But the, the goannas uh, would have that sort of reptilian characteristic that could have survived on on rafts for a long time, and so have the opportunity over long periods of time yeah. to disperse. And they've been around for a long period of time. So there's, there's some information about the goannas in the MOOC that I'll not just briefly reiterate some of that. Generally speaking, when you look at a group at its distribution, so this is a family, uh, Goranides, it's a family of lizards, and they're very obviously different from other lizards. You know, um, I mean, in, in appearance, so it's they're quite recognizable. Yeah. And if you look at a, at, a, at a group like that, it's just worldwide distribution. Usually, when you see that it's very common in one part of the world, that usually that's a good clue. Well, that's probably where they originated. That's where they, yeah. they started out. That's not the case for the goannas, for the goannid lizards. The fossil evidence is really clear on this. They're fossils much, much older, like you know, 20 million or 20 or 25 million years older in Eurasia than than oldest fossils in, a, in Australia. They've been in Australia for a long time, about 20, 24, 25 million years at least, but they've been in Eurasia for 45 million years. So they've obviously come from Eurasia, crossed over uh, probably at one, uh, you know, one of these periods where the, the land masses were fairly close together, but but they're good at hanging on to trees and rafting around and after storms and that sort of thing. But once they got here, along you know, 25 million years or so ago, they really took it on as, as home. And this this is where they've diversified, speciated, radiated to enormous degrees. So that nowadays more than half of the world species of varanid lizards are in Australia. And some some really different groups, like most varanids or the typical varanid, I should say, is quite a big a big animal. Some of them are enormous. In, in Australia, we've, we've got big ones. Of, there's a fossil, um, fossil megalania. megalania that yeah. is enormous, bigger than the Komodo dragon. Um, and but also they've speciated into some very small, mm -hmm. very, really very gecko-sized the pig, um, pygmy pygmy goannas. Pygmy goannas that, that live usually under spinifex or under under rocks and those those sorts of habitats. Not not very visible. You could live in, a long, in Australia for a long time without seeing one unless you were you know, actively looking for one. But So this is a case where Australia is the, is the place where they've really radiated, really been successful, but they didn't originate here. That's right. And, and it's interesting too because they were probably largely a tropical group. And then in Australia, a lot of these endemic species are actually desert species. So they've evolved into species that can survive really well in the desert. And some people at least recognise a sort of a sub-family that's a yeah. group that's, that's a, just Australian and meant to Australia. So. Yeah. And they've gone right down to the bottom of Australia. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not Tasmania, but uh, they've gone to other islands off the south coast. Sa Kangaroo Island was a very uh, vibrant, uh, you know, big population of one species of you know, good moderate size around it. Mm -hmm. But they're in, in some ways, they're sort of out of their element there. Like you said, they're a tropical group. I really like the warm weather, and it can, it can be really gets pretty, pretty cold for them. So they actually spend a lot of the year inactive, but they're reptiles, and they they can do that as long as they are able to get a good feed.
a couple of good feeds during the uh, mm -hmm. summer months, they can survive the cold, cold winters. So someone here has asked about would it take more than one crossing event, and that is an interesting question in that um, that's right. I mean, with the Goannas, we think that there was an early group like Keith did about 25 million years ago, but then another group of just a few species of living mangroves and so on that probably arrived relatively recently, maybe in the last couple of million years, which is still a long time, I think. But the question about either you require a male and female or a whole group to come across, because obviously they need to reproduce, and this is a really interesting question, and it's one that people have had trouble with in thinking of how things would colonise, or the other possibility is that you could have a pregnant female which had offspring and then it's a bit, you know, a bit naughty, but they would then produce with each other. Yeah, and then yeah, and there's also the third possibility, and that is you have parthenogenesis. Right. So that's where females reproduce without males, and there are some some Australian geckos, mm. and there is some evidence that a cop that at least one varanid species is parthenogenetic. That, right. That's not the typical form of reproduction for varanids, for the monitor lizards, but, it, but uh, there's some evidence that at least in one species it has, it has occurred. But mostly they, they reproduce sex normally yeah. sexually. But certainly geckos, there's quite a few geckos that are that do that. genetic. Yeah. So that one, we've got one there about were there ever Komodo dragons in northern Australia? Done not that I've ever heard of, but then there was this, the, the, the bigger thing that, you know, it, Back in the, I think it's Pleistocene. Yeah, what do you mean? Uh, Megalania was just even bigger than the Komodo dragon. Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting because the Komodo dragon really only occurs on Komodo and a couple of little islands on either side. So it's a real funny one. It's an endemic species just for that little part of the of, uh, of Indonesia there. So, but yeah, probably um, probably didn't didn't ever occur in northern Australia. But I guess what I'm being trying to get to here, this idea of things crossing the line and not crossing the line and so on, is that really there's this idea of this double filter effect where you've got the Australian fauna down in the southeast and you've got the oriental fauna up in the northwest. And what you have really is the Australian fauna sort of moving along uh, this way from uh, along Nusa Tenggara and then you have the oriental fauna coming down this way. And some species are moving more, you know, uh, dispersed and can move more quickly or more easily like bats, and some species have trouble. And so you're getting a mix of these two, and if anything, there's sort of a gradient. There's a complete mix of species, and certain islands will have a kind of a weird assemblage of species that have come partly from the Australian fauna and partly from the Oriental. And so certain groups have really spread right through that area, and certain groups, have, as we've seen, haven't even really made it as far as the line. So. Um, so really thinking about more in those terms might be slightly better than just this idea of a line and a yeah, It's a pretty blurry line. It's a blurry line. <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay, well we've probably talked enough about that. Um, so just, we've had a few things in the forums uh, this week. So one thing that I was sort of mentioning was this um, birds of paradise and it's something that we haven't really spoken about much in the MOOC. And uh, I've got a little quote there from Malaya Papelago about Wallace saying many of his journeys, journeys were made with the express object of obtaining specimens. And he was very, very interested. People in Europe knew that these things existed, but there were a lot of myths and strange ideas about them. And, you know, he was collecting for to send these things back to Europe so that people would buy these collections. And he was collecting beetles and butterflies and birds and all manner of things. Um, that was how he was supporting himself, basically. He was a collector. So the bird of paradise was a big thing for him. And, and very, very important. And as I mentioned, it only occurs really right down the end near, near, in New Guinea and in those islands uh, near New Guinea. Uh, a few people have mentioned that the, um, there's a Bill Bailey show um, where he's talking about Wallace and he's actually in Indonesia. Uh, it's on SBS for people who are in Australia. I think if you're overseas, you can get it online. Um, so a few people have mentioned that and I watched part one the other night and it was actually very entertaining, so that's, that's good. Um, and also some people who are actually reading the Malay Archipelago, and I think that's good. I've got a, I've got my copy here. Um, I recommend either, as we've mentioned on the site, either you can download the, the PDF um, from Wallace Online, or you know just getting a paper copy is really good. You can flip through it and make notes and stuff. Um, but it's just a really interesting read. 
and it's you know like a, a travel um, a travel book really and a, an old travel book you know but actually really interesting in to, with the natural history as well um, but really just an interesting read so, and if you're ever likely to visit Indonesia uh, definitely read um, or you know take a copy of, of Malay Archipelago when you go somebody else <laughs> mentioned this idea about uh, sea levels which is great and and Lake Carpentaria now Wallace was a, ahead of his time again in that he was thinking about he knew that there was a shallow sea in the area on the western part of New Guinea and he talks about um, suggests that there might have been a recent land connection so maybe he, he had some idea that sea levels actually could change which was pretty radical uh, for the time and he talks about the Aru Islands and some of those other islands that are very close to New Guinea and how closely their mammals and birds are related to those in New Guinea and he's thinking already in those times that they're connected by this shallow sea and that presumably what happened in the past was that they were actually connected and things could move across and he talks a bit about the 100 fathom line which I think is about 200 metres depth um, and it marks out also accurately the range of the paradise birds and again that's a species of birds of paradise, a group of birds of paradise that are restricted to that part of the Malay Archipelago. And if we look on this diagram here, and this shows the, um, the seabed around this area. So here's Darwin down here. And there's Melville Island that we mentioned where the Napa Palm occurs. Um, and over here I've written Aru. And this is Aru Island where Wallace visited. And as you can see, this is all shallow sea. This is continental shelf. This is all within the 100 fathom line and at the low sea stand which recently might have only been as much as say 15,000 years ago so not that long ago and then several times um, during glacial periods in the last million years or so this, this whole area would have been dry land and as someone mentioned in this area here in the Gulf of Carpentaria there was a big lake which people have called Lake Carpentaria and various rivers would have flowed into it from northern Australia and it presumably would have been you know partly saline um, but this, this and this whole lake formed and so presumably animals and plants could traverse this area and it's thought that uh, this might have been uh, savanna mostly at various times so over thousands and thousands of years animals and plants would have moved across this area interesting also that we look at the seabed here there's this deep trench the Timor Trench which separates Australia from Timor and that's one reason why we have some things that are similar to, to the animals and plants in Timor but generally speaking um, not that many things close to that and actually sort of several oriental forms. So it's interesting that Wallace was already thinking about these sorts of things you know over 150 years ago, a long, long time ago. Yep. Alright, um, so just a quick quiz to break things up. Um, and so everyone's been reading lots about Darwin and lots about Wallace and we did mention that Wallace was a bit younger so he's a bit of a, I don't know, not a young upstart but he, um, in terms of them both publishing these ideas on natural selection in a way, I mean we talked about how Darwin kind of maybe took a little bit of time to, to publish his, the theory um, whereas Wallace actually really probably just got straight in there and when he finally came up with the idea he, uh, he basically wrote up in just a few days and Send his, send his manuscript off to Darwin. Um, so, but um, Wallace was a bit younger. So, what have we got there? We've got a few votes. Let's see who's been. Uh, let's see who's been studying. Three options there. So a little bit younger, or A, B, and C. Fourteen years. Yep. Let's see. Yes, correct. Yep. People have done very well. Yeah. So he, uh, and as, as we said earlier, he outlived Darwin by a long time. So, mm -hmm. uh, so he, uh, 1913. Uh, in the latter part of his life, uh, sort of after Darwin, then he uh, died. Wallace became the he was really regarded as the, the the most eminent naturalist around. So he was quite quite well regarded and um, and very famous in, in, in the latter part of his life. Yeah. And actually, because we've had a bit of a few questions in the forums about this, about how Wallace has been in the shadow of Darwin, and that's right. And it, it's interesting in a way that um, 
if that's true, then it, it's, it's it's a fairly recent phenomenon. In other words, in the late 1800s, mm. I don't think that you'd say that is true. Yeah. Maybe in the early 1900s, when people started talking about evolution, they referred to it as Darwinian evolution, not Darwinian Wallace evolution. <laughs> and so I, mean, I suppose maybe, I don't know, it probably certainly didn't receive the attention that Darwin did for that in that regard. But he was he was never forgotten by biologists. He's yeah. never been obscure, uh, at least to people who, you know, zoologists, biogeographers, and people who were in the field. People interested in biology, that's right. I mean, yeah. I think they were going. And I think there's this idea that people have been saying about how that, you know, maybe Darwin, I don't know, that, that Wallace wasn't probably recognised or, or so on. But I think he did recognise, and there's a quote there about, this is Wallace actually speaking about Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species, which Wallace read, read multiple times. He read it you know, five or six times, possibly more, with each edition. He read it again. And, you know, he says there, really, with, without all the experimenting things that Wallace did, he doesn't feel like he could have accumulated all that evidence and done all those things that, that Darwin had spent you know, 15, 20 years just accumulating evidence on that, on that point. So it was really a big undertaking. Yeah, so, and when you think about the, the body of work, not only the origin of species, but the descent of man and, and, and sexual yeah. selection. I mean, Darwin wrote multiple books on the yeah. topic. Yeah. And uh, although Wallace was very prolific and wrote some good things, particularly about biogeography, his contribution to evolution was really the, the joint paper with, with Darwin, and that's where he, mm -hmm. you know, that's which is a relatively short body of work compared to, you know, to Darwin. So, it, you know, I, I think they both deserve credit, but yeah. certainly Darwin put the, put in the years and years of work. And, and you know, obviously Wallace's contributions to biogeography was very important. You know, yeah. he wrote about the geographical distribution of animals and so on. And so he's still thought of as the father of biogeography. And yeah. in that field, you know, if you're a biogeographer, obviously Wallace is hugely important. So his major contributions were really in that area. Darwin's contributions were in slightly different areas. So um, I guess I just wanted to point out as well that it's interesting that although perhaps Wallace might have been in a bit in the shadow, that he actually also had his own collecting assistants, um, Charles Allen and a Malay uh, young lad, only about 15, when he started working with Wallace who actually helped him with a lot of the collecting. And in a way, really, he didn't acknowledge these people terribly much in the Malay Archipelago and in his, in his articles, in his collections and all those sorts of things. He doesn't really acknowledge these people terribly much. And yet, Charles Allen collected literally thousands of specimens of beetles and butterflies and also went out and collected birds and all sorts of things. So uh, it's interesting that you know, at the time he was just sort of an employee or something. Um, and so Wallace doesn't really really talk about that much. Yeah. Um, that last point somebody made me in the form that they were both particularly, well, they both spent a lot of time in the field. And, yeah. and what Darwin did on the voyage, not after that, but, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he certainly put in the time during the, the voyage and then, and then, as we said earlier, Wallace put in lots of time, many years. And of course, one of the interests that they both had were beetles. I mean, I think we mentioned this um, maybe the first week that beetles are an extraordinarily diverse group, and this is just a, a you know, small collection of them. This is the sort of way that they would, although they would, Wallace would have put them much closer together, stacked them in his yeah, 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 big cabinets, of big cabinets, yeah. and, and then ship, ship them back in that sort of way. But this yeah. is the way they would have been displayed yeah. in general. And just seeing all that diversity, you know, traveling to the tropics and seeing that huge diversity of beetles, I think was one reason why the both of them yeah. began to understand about this whole idea of variation and, you know, and started to think about species and so on so much because there are so many beetles. It's just amazing, the diversity. So um, it's just another thing I think that they had in common in addition to the sorts of things they read about, the fact that they traveled and experienced things, you know, this interesting beetles was probably pretty important. Waits was a beetle collector, I mean, they were all, you know. Yeah. Um, so look, I just guess I want to, we're probably getting close towards the end here. I just wanted to, to talk about this briefly. This is so, Wallace, as I mentioned, was this uh, very important biogeographer. And one of the things he did in his geogra geographical distribution of animals, which he wrote um, after the Malay Archipelago, and in it he breaks the world up into these realms that we've seen, these zoogeographic realms. It's interesting that he also has these sort of sub-regions. So we see in Africa, um, 
there's a region here which is really in the in the tropical equatorial region, this area surrounding which is largely savannah and so on, and then the southern Cape region. And he also differentiates Madagascar. And the same thing in the Australian region, so Australia, which he separates from New Guinea, and then New Zealand down here is a separate region, and then this whole sort of Pacific Islands as being a kind of a separate area. And I just wanted to compare this because in a recent analysis, so this is a paper that's just come out recently in the journal Science, and these people did a very detailed analysis. It says here 21,000 species of amphibians, non-pelagic birds and non-marine mammals, meaning all the terrestrial animals, basically mammals, birds and amphibians. And they did these detailed analyses and you know multiple statistical tests and all these sorts of things. And they basically came up with regions that are pretty much similar to what, you know, there's the Australian region, there's New Zealand as a sub-region. They sort of link New Guinea with this ocean, oceanic region here. Um, they differentiate this Sino-Japanese region as being slightly different, but again, a lot of sort of, sort of sub-regions. Uh, this tropical region, Madagascar is a separate thing, which Wallace said. So amazing really to me that Wallace was just reading and having travelled to some of these places, yeah, I mean, not, all them, not all of them by any means, yeah. and yet he made a few errors, but generally speaking, it was, it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and this is not perfect either. I mean, this is just, I mean, yeah. they, they didn't actually include the reptiles in that. So no. It's a pretty big terrestrial group to exclude. I'm not sure why. So, uh, you know. but, but anyway, I mean, it'll never be perfect. But they're all categories, they're all boxes that we humans try to put things in, and that's, mm. you know, just to, to help us understand the world. So, yeah. his. This was probably, you know, arguably about as good as the uh, 2013 version. I think it's a pretty good. I think it's a pretty good effort myself. Yeah. And I mean, we do keep categorising things, and this is just one last thing I'll say is that even within Wallacea, so we talked about this area between Wallace's line and Lydica's line, and looking at this, there's a book on the birds of Wallacea, and they actually divide the area partly for convenience, but partly because they see these being as sort of separate areas. And so this, they draw a line sort of somewhere here. So they have a Nusa Tengara region. They have this Moluccas region. And this line goes sort of roughly here and around these islands and, and kind of up there. Um, and then they have the Sulawesi region, because as we mentioned, that has a lot of endemic species, including lots of weird and wonderful uh, endemic birds. So they actually, again, people sort of making regions within regions. So there's the general global geographic, geographic region, <coughs> and then within Malaysia you can have subregions, and we can do the same things uh, in Australia, for example. So, um, and this is the uh, in Australia we think about biogeography in Australia, and this is so thinking really now about about next week as well in some in some ways. Um, this is this Torresian biogeographic region, which is where we are in Darwin, so in northern Australia, you know. Um, Wet, wet summers and, and wind, dry winters, um, tropical species, savannas, all those sorts of things. So there's a whole group of animals and plants that really only occur in the northern part of Australia, as opposed to this whole desert, this massive desert or Aryan uh, region in central Australia. And then in the south, uh, you have the southwest, which is separated by many people because it has endemic species of, of frog, for example, which is separated by the Nullarbor Plain, which occurs in the middle here, which is now basically desert from the other wetter regions in the southeast, which is this, this bassium. So next week we'll um, we'll talk about that. So, but we just want to sort of finish with um, we we found this uh, photo yesterday of the Wallace statue that's been unveiled. So, yeah. the museum, uh, history museum in London. So that was I think on the seventh of around about the seventh of, this, of uh, November. Uh, celebrating or commemorating, I should say, commemorating yeah. the, the death of Wallace 100 years ago. So again, that whole Wallace uh, Wallace 100. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things going on uh, related to that. So thanks everybody for um, for joining us today. And uh, once again, I will just um, leave you a quote, and we'll see you in Darwin next week. So this is actually about this strait between um, Bali and Lombok, where where the Wallace line actually is. There's a bit of text there, so I'll leave you with it for a couple of minutes. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you, uh, see you next week.